right, here we go again, everyone. Welcome back into the We Shall Not Sleep podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy Hump Day, as always, and happy belated Fourth of July to my fellow Americans. I'm not sure if we have any other listeners from any other countries, but welcome in regardless. And for those who were not uh, here the last uh, week or are not uh, familiar with this podcast in general, a lot of times I like to introduce the podcast, but then go into an interview. This last couple of weeks, just because I've had a lot of scheduling conflicts here, a lot of things have gotten gotten slammed as far as our scheduling process. I've been releasing hopefully more of these talk show drive time uh, segments that I try to do every other week, but you've been bombarded with just me here. I know a lot of you are saying, when's our next guest? And I promise that's coming soon. Uh, and like I said, I've had to reschedule a lot of things like backups to my backups, but that's okay. As far as content, you can ask my family. I'm never out of things to say. And in particular, as we just got over the 4th of July here, which is a day of independence, a celebration of independence, July 4th, 1776, you know, here we are as a country, United States, you know, celebrating that independence, but this idea of freedom. That, and that's something I talked about uh, this past Sunday in, in the sermon I preached. And I kind of touched on this theme of chasing freedom, how throughout history, including our shared Christian uh, heritage and history with um, the children of Israel, you know, escaping the bondages of Pharaoh uh, in Egypt and then going into the promised land only to be enslaved by their own uh, wretched and sinful behavior. Um, this idea of freedom, this this liberty, this agency, this freedom that we've been given, and most Christians would acknowledge that we have this idea of free will, that God loves us enough to give us our own liberty to basically choose to live without him. In fact, that's how much God loves us is that he will allow us the ability to not choose him, to choose our own way. And as painful as that might be as our heavenly father, he wants us and he respects us to give us that agency. He doesn't want to force us into a relationship that we don't want. In fact, that would be tyrannical. And I know a lot of people call God a tyrant, but he doesn't force us to love him against our own will. And so this this notion of freedom is not just something that you know we celebrate here in America, and I totally get it. But it, it is something that I wanted to bring up because you know, if you look at the freedom in our country, if you look at how we have defined it historically, there's been a lot of associations with certain aspects of our country and freedom. And I think just a little bit of context, when you look at our Declaration of Independence and you look at the, the phrasing of some of the words of created, created equal, uh, this idea that we were set aside by our creator and we were endowed with certain unalienable rights. You know, those particular things, those ideologies only come from the Judeo-Christian worldview. Because if you look at Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, hu secular humanism, maybe atheism, there's not an acknowledgement of that type of equality. There's not a, an idea that, you know, humanity, all of us, men, women, children, we're all equal, we're all the same. And that only comes from the Judeo-Christian worldview. I'm not saying that all of our founding fathers were Bible-believing Christians, all acknowledging, you know, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Not necessarily. I get that. But they did understand having an equal footing in a, in a framework where you have the people all given the same voice, and they decide things would be potentially the best way to run a country, a, a self-governing country where people are going to have the freedom to practice whatever religion. And so they, they took the one religion and, and belief system that you know puts it at the top, but puts freedom and equality at the top. Now, there will be people that, and I understand why, and it's not like they don't have a good point, but they'll say, well, we didn't immediately live up to those circumstances. That is correct. We did not. Now, we are only 245 years old as a, as a country. Now, our Constitution was ratified much later, right? But uh, I don't say much later, um, a decade and a half later, roughly, um, was it 17, 1788 was our Constitution ratified? So, like, this notion that we got it right right from the beginning, no. We, we, we had a Revolutionary War, we started things, and we fought a civil war. And, and slavery and, and freedom of man, that was a huge thing, and... Then over a century later, we had the Civil Rights Movement. And then there's a lot of commentary 60 years later from that about where things are at now. But 245 years for a country that exists with as much diversity as, as the planet has seen uh, in quite some time, if you want to look at, at that, that's pretty remarkable what we've done in a short period of time. That does not mean everything we've done 
has been good. But look what happens when, when freedom uh, precedes all of that. That's very important. Now, those other countries, people want to make arguments about other countries doing the same thing. But the, the, the key thing is that Europe is much older than the United States, much older. They exist thousands of years, you know, same families and bloodlines being passed down, and they didn't do make any changes. They saw us. They took our cues from us, and they took it from, I, from, I would imagine, their creator, trying to live up to these certain things. Now, I might history, history people might say that I'm wrong and, and certain that it might be a little naive, so forgive me. You can fact check me later. But, but America's still very young, deciding to do this for ourselves. Like, that's a huge thing because we're basically a baby on the world scale that because of our, our experience, our lack of experience, rather. And this, this idea here of freedom in our country, there, there sometimes can be a misnomer because I think, and I truly believe the United States is one of the most spiritually impoverished places on the planet because we have everything we need and nothing at the same time. And I'm talking about the spirit life because... The Bible does tell us that God, you know, and through the words of Jesus, he will provide. I mean, the fact that he asked those rhetorical questions, like, look at the lilies of the field, look at the birds of the air. Does God not love those things? How much more valuable to you, are, are you than birds? And it's like, well, God, I mean, he will protect us. But here's the thing here, the illusion here is that we're, all that's given to us by our rights, you know, ratified in the Constitution, given to us by governments, uh, local government, state, federal, is that if we all left the church tomorrow, no one went to church coming this Sunday, all um, 100 million, 150 million of us, if we decide, no, we don't need God anymore. Now, we, I think there will be some consequences for sure, but it's not like we're going to just our food, our clothing, our houses, our cars, our jobs are just going to disappear. We still have all the basic commodities. Poor people, but the poor will always be with us. Jesus even says that. Now, he says that in a different context I'm using here. There's always going to be need because we live in a fallen and broken world. But the thing is, is this idea that all that would go away. No, that, that's not true necessarily. Like I, I don't know everything. I'm not God, so I don't know what the type of judgment that would be if literally everyone stopped going to church. But I can tell you this, though, is that we have everything we need. So the question is, why would we need God? You know, we have everything that we could possibly think of. It's no wonder. It's no wonder why God is just fit into our schedule when we need him, when we feel bad, or it's like, well, I got sports, I got kids, I got my job, I'm really tired. I have all the reasons. And some of those are very good reasons. I'm not saying they're, they're excuses. But we do make excuses, though, if we're being honest, right? We make excuses for not spending time with God and putting him first in our life. He, he's basically getting the, the scraps, the leftovers, and then we have the audacity to complain to him, right? Well, our freedom has, has given us a lot of wealth and a lot of affluence. And that affluence has really turned us slothful. Turned, it's turned us, it turned us into apathetic and lazy people for the most part, including us Christians. Because in other countries... The, the, the livelihood is provided through the church. The sense of family, the devotion, the faithfulness, the trust is provided through the church. And so the reliance upon God is so much higher because all those other rights, those pleasures of life are not guaranteed. There's no sense of entitlement to them, which is what we fall prey to all the time in this nation. And when, when I look at this idea of freedom, you have to look at Jesus as his coming Messiah. Again, the reasons why a lot, a lot of Jews according to Athanasius, you know, St. Athanasius, uh, writing in the 4th century, the, the Jews missed him because they were expecting somebody to come down and overthrow the government and to just come down, chariots of fire, throw it up. I mean, you said you're going to set the captives free. It was prophesied. That's what you're, what you're here to do. Like, we have our own physical prisons here. And Jesus was referring to the hearts and the minds of people. He was here to change hearts. Give people spiritual food, something that will fill that existential dread and that massive void that's in our hearts. That's what he was here to do. And when you hear the words captives free, you're thinking of prison. You're, maybe you're thinking of, of slavery, and, and you're like, well, being, being free from that is, I don't have this on me anymore. But I want to at least suggest to you that many of the disciples who were imprisoned and then eventually martyred, including Jesus himself, were never more free when they were submitting themselves to God. Jesus himself was never more free than when he was being nailed to the cross. 
Think about that. Because he was submitting himself to the Father's will, but he did so freely. He did so without being compelled, convicted, guilt-tripped, or being brainwashed or manipulated into being that way. He freely gave it to him in his own words. No one takes my life from me. I lay my life down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. Right there. Freedom. True freedom. Chasing freedom. And this does not mean that there are true injustices. That there are true sufferings and longings in the world that that actually impact our physical lives. Absolutely. But for those chasing those, those things, I just want to make sure our hearts are free. That we are not enslaved to this idea of, of our own selfish motive, if you will, that even if we try to do something good, we can still have a, a, a bad motive. In, and, and that's where God, he can work through those end outcomes, absolutely. But if our motive's not there, what's happening to us in the process? And then finally here in closing, the word privilege gets used in negative, negative connotations all the time now which is funny because it's actually a positive word. I, I couldn't choose when I was born, who I was born to, my gender, or my ethnicity. All those things were determined to me by God. He is the one who controlled that. We believe we're here for a, a purpose. And when you look at my life and what I've been given, what, what God has bless this nation with, which, which is affluence, which we've wasted. I'm not going to say that we've been responsible with it because we absolutely have not been. It's, but I, would, I don't feel bad for when I was born, why I was born, that I'm a, you know, a white male. I, I don't feel bad about that. I'm really getting tired of people telling me I should feel bad. Maybe it's not people. Maybe it's headlines. But I don't. What I'd feel bad is if I were to take that and then use that for some nefarious gain, instead of using it for the glory of God, I just set it aside and, eh, no, I don't care what God wants. I'm going to do whatever I want. Or, life's about me. I only got one life to live and I'm going to live it now. And if I have to step on people, crush people beneath my feet, I'm going to do it. See, it's not been, it's, it's being given the gift That is a privilege, yes. It's something we're not entitled to, but we couldn't control. God gave it to us. What are we doing with that gift? If we've been given the physical freedom, what are we doing to help those who don't have it? I think that's the better question to ask. Not feel shame. See, Satan wants to take that and shame you. Again, we didn't have any control over it. Even if there was no God, I couldn't control it. I don't feel ashamed about that. I think what we feel shame is when other people are in other circumstances and we do nothing to help out, and we feel that conviction. And so the world tries to shame, whereas we're, we're trying to feel that conviction of the Holy Spirit. We have different language to describe it because it's a, it's a different purpose. Shame is never from God. Shame is not from godly people. That is not feeling that, I mean, that's not holy. Feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you know, that gulp moment of like, yeah, that was, you know, that was wrong, or that was that was bad of me, or Oh boy, uh, I, f- I feel convicted there. That can be something from the Holy Spirit and it can also be, be used with other people. God can speak through other people to hold us to account, much like Nathan did to David. So those, those are some thoughts. I mean, I don't. where do we go from here? It's again, chasing freedom. I guess to summarize, a little Spark Notes version, is that we can have everything we want and still be enslaved in our hearts and vice versa. We can be in chains, physical chains, but be totally free. Don't waste the blessings that God has given you. Don't feel shamed because of the things you couldn't control. That's illogical anyway. It's irrational. But instead, ask God how you can use them for his kingdom. And I promise you, this world will be changed for the better. Thank you, everyone, so much. As always, may God bless you and may God keep you.